Well, hey, everybody. Uh, I, I think if you have a pulse, and if you're American and college-aged, you probably made a March Madness bracket. Uh, I did not for two reasons. The first reason being because I particularly don't really care that much about college uh, sports. But the second reason being uh, because I get to skip or avoid that part of the month where everyone is just upset and depressed because they, uh, their bracket was busted. So I get to just skip over that. And that's, that's one of the reasons why uh, I don't do it. Uh, but it's, it's almost impossible, uh, if you've noticed, to avoid uh, the hype of March Madness. Uh, I don't know where you get your haircuts, sport clips, right? Uh, it's just there. Uh, if you're like me and you have roommates, uh, they're practically sleeping and living uh, right by the TV. Uh, so if a game isn't on, then they have highlights on, and it's just the incessant hearing of, of all the cheering and everything. Uh, one thing that I, I do love about March Madness, though, is that when the camera pans away from the action and it goes up to the audience and it shows the parents who are chewing their nails and praying to their basketball gods, right? <laughs> and then it, it, it pans over to the cheerleaders and they're like, oh, sports! That's, that's the male cheerleader. And then, and then it, it pans over to the bench, right? And they're just like, put me in, coach, right? And then, and then the coach is just like, we're up by 30, but I don't care, right? Uh, I love seeing the reactions, but what I really love is that everyone seems so united. They're just so together, right? They're on this journey together, and you can just, like, feel, uh, you know, when they make a point, you know, they're just like, oh, this is, this is it. This is us. We are united. I love that. And I, I'm curious, imagine for a second, what if your church was as united as a college basketball team? Mm -hmm. And I thought about this. I thought, what, what would my church look like? Well, I think... Uh, the First Impressions team would maybe have face painting at the door. Uh, I think uh, congregants during the sermon would be sitting at the edge of their seats, you know, just like, hey, cool. that's a good point. Uh, I, I think during the worship, um, in between songs, the worship leader would be going like, hey, you know, right, high five. Uh, I think after the sermon, they'd interview uh, the, the pastor and say, you know, uh, tell us more about that triangle offense against sin, you know. Uh, I, I, I just, I, I like to think about that. <laughs> That would be an exciting church, right? That would be a united church. Unfortunately, though, church as a whole is not so united. Church is split. Uh, if you didn't know this, there are 41,000 Christian denominations alone. Uh, someone once said where there are two or more Baptists gathered, there are three or more opinions. <laughs> Sorry, Adam, I, I'm glad he's not here today. Uh, today, though, I'm not arguing against denominations. I'm arguing against divisions in the church. So I'm asking you guys today, let's examine our hearts and find places where we are content with exclusion in our church. Let's find places where we have exchanged godly desires for our own desires. Now, if we've learned anything in the College of Ministry, it's that we are the church, right? The church is not something other, it's us, right? That's the church. So when we say that the church is divided, we are the ones divided. Jesus does not differentiate us by our church. He doesn't say, oh, is that uh, Josh of uh, First Assembly of junior year? No, is that Nate of, you know, First Assembly of Our Lady of the Peace or whatever? No, <laughs> he looks at us united as his bride. That's what he sees. And we are finicky people, though. Right, God has given each of us our own desires and thoughts and thought structures, right? And when we come together, it's bound to create disunity. It's bound to. Unity does not mean that we have to agree on everything. It certainly doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean we have to come from the social class. It doesn't mean we have to look the same, act the same, talk the same, dress the same. That's not what unity is about. It's about having one mind, the mind of Jesus Christ. We go to, serve at, talk about churches that fit our molds. And we say, I think I can really grow at this church. When really, we're not going to grow at all because all we are is comfortable there. <laughs> Poor people coming to my church makes me feel uncomfortable. I'm talking, they can't afford food on a table poor, not college student poor. We can afford coffee every day, but not our tithe. Right. People that wear clothes from Walmart don't get invited to small groups from people that wear H&M, right? Worship leaders play hymns, old hymns, not the cool new stuff, but the old stuff, and young people get upset 
right? Or they play more contemporary stuff, and, and older people say there's time for a change. People leave church when they can't find community that will accept them. People leave church because of cliques. All too often, cliques start with the leadership or with those serving. Serving groups become life groups, become, you're not like me, please don't ask to join my group. <laughs> People leave church because they're lonely. I have left church because of loneliness. Or how about this? Do we cringe when a homosexual sits next to us in church? Or do we even know what that's like? Because we've never had a homosexual sit by us in church. <laughs> have we said the church is for broken people, but not broken homosexual people? The truth is we die on so many hills when Jesus only died on one. Mm -hmm. Today we're going to look at the Corinthian church. If you know about the Corinthian church, it's a church of disunity. It's a church of division. We can learn a lot from them even today. But before we jump into scripture, there are some things about the culture of Corinth that will be helpful to us in understanding their context. So I want you guys to listen for similarities in their society as well as ours and in their church as well as ours. Now, Corinth was a great crossroads city, which meant that uh, if you were going in or out of Greece, or if you were sailing around it, you had to go through Corinth. Everyone went through Corinth. And so they were a Grecian society, which means that they valued uh, wisdom above anything. And so they had wisdom coming from northeast, southwest, everywhere. That's what they valued. Uh, it was a society of rampant sexual immorality, so much uh, unlike today's culture. Uh, this issue even directly bled over into sexual immorality uh, division in the church, where there was a, a member in their small church that was committing incest, that they were just like, well, I don't know what to do. <laughs> uh, they worshipped uh, the goddess of Aphrodite. She was the goddess of beauty and love and passion and pleasure and procreation. Right? And in fact, they put uh, the temple to Aphrodite on the highest hill, the Acrocorinth, in Corinth, as if to say, our highest priority is sex. During the day, the workers would, would be you know, looking up and they'd be like, oh, I just wish I could go worship my God, right? Their worship consisted of having sex with the priests and priestesses, right? So this is the culture, this is the society. And Aphrodite wasn't their only God. There was 26 main deities in Corinth, gods and, and deities that they'd worship for uh, uh, agriculture, and uh, weather, fertility, luck, and more. It's also very important to note that Corinth was heavily divided uh, by social class. Today there are social classes, yes, we get that. We are maybe on, on the relatively poor side, uh, considering, I don't know, Bill Gates. But uh, even today, though, there are movements in and out of the church for social equality, racial equality, gender equality, uh, wealth redistribution if you're a Bernie supporter. Right? Yeah. However, in Corinth, there was no problem with inequality. It was an agreed upon way of life. If you were of noble birth, you were blessed by the gods. If you were of common birth, uh, you were the sewage of society, and you accepted that. Now, the church in Corinth could have been one household at this time that Paul wrote the letter. Uh, it could have been a few households, but it was still small. And uh, Paul wrote this letter, it was his, actually his second letter, 1 Corinthians was his second letter to the Corinthians of four, but we only have two remaining. And he's responding to a woman named Chloe who, who brought up these divisions in the church. Here's the situation, their church met in the home. It was common for wealthier houses to uh, have a courtyard, and they would surround the courtyard. And so they would have their church service, they would fellowship in the courtyard, and then here's what would happen for communion, the wealthy people or the people that brought food would go inside while the poor people would actually, like, literally stand outside and watch the other believers take communion. It's incredible. It's appalling. The idea to include the poor wasn't even on their minds. It wasn't even wrong to them. And the poor didn't really expect anything better. They were just happy to be in the courtyard. We come to find the Corinthians are completely separated, separated with divisions. And Paul yells, stop! And this is where we find Paul. So Paul knows these things, and this is his goal. He states it simply in 1 Corinthians 1.10. He says this, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. 
Now this is a new way of thinking in this society. I can imagine them reading this letter, the wealthy people all nervous, right? the poor people looking dumbfounded. We get to eat together? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but they're far from that moment. He's still writing this letter, and that's where we find our main text for today. 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 17, Paul says this, But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because you're idiots, no. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe that in part, for there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. Yes, it is. We're having communion, right? No. He says, no, it's not. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? So, there's an exclamation point. <laughs> what? Original Little John. Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No. I will not. I think their church looks a lot like our modern churches. Sure, we don't have VIP sections where you get chicken instead of wafers, right? But we still divide. We've learned so much over 2,000 years in academics, technology, thought structure, but the church has regressed in so many. We're still separated by the same things. I wonder what would happen if we truly understood the unity that Jesus was talking about in John 17, 22, when he said this. The glory that you have given me, talking to his Father, I have given to them, talking to us, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and loved them even as you have loved me. I think if our churches reflected that, they would look radically different. So the question now becomes, what does it mean for our church to be united? What does it mean for us to be one? It means pursue the mind of Christ. Romans 12, 16, Paul says this, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. You see, because Jesus pursued the marginalized, he did not differentiate between social classes. He approached sinners and saints alike and invited them into community. So do not accept division in your church as commonplace or natural. There was an animated show in the early 1990s, and uh, the, the catchphrase of these people was, together, our powers combined, right? Our powers combined, and then they would morph into this captain planet. And then uh, a few years after that, there was a show, maybe you guys remember, uh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Okay, Power just me. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, right? Mm -hmm. And they would morph together and create this unified body. It was really something special back then. <laughs> <laughs> I hope and pray that we would be unquestionably united, that when the world looks at us, and at our churches, they would see the one that we worship. Mm -hmm. It's time now for everyone's favorite part of sermons, the application. <laughs> Trust me, it's just as hard for me to give application as it is for Christians to truly apply it. So I have three simple ways to unify ourselves as the church. The first one is to forgive. Be quick to forgive. If at this moment you can think of someone in your current church or home church that has wronged you and you've not forgiven them, please seek reconciliation. The inability to forgive, to forgive what is what causes division. Ephesians 4.32 says this, another one of Paul's many letters, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. And that is radical forgiveness that we're called to do. Number two, expel the immoral member. I'm kidding. Some of you started writing that down. No, two is love. It's not enough to love God. We're also called to love the church. I challenge you to uh, choose love over personal convenience. 
Choose to love those who are not like you. Pursue relationship with the isolated people. We should have binoculars looking for anyone who's sitting by themselves. Independence is not the goal. So have people over for ice cream. Or soy ice cream if they're lactose intolerant. <laughs> <laughs> Plan on worship that at your house. Invite the people that wear different clothes than you. Put those action words, verbs to work. Thirdly, lastly, seek the Spirit. Jude one nineteen says this. It, it talks about those who cause divisions are the ones that are devoid of the Spirit. You see, the Spirit brings unity. I read the other day the story of Elisha, and I guess I must have missed this uh, when I read it the last time. But when he saw Elijah, the prophet, and the power that he had, and after Elijah was gone, he prayed and he said, I want twice that, God. I want twice the power. I want twice the Spirit. And so I think we really need to do that. I think we need to pray for twice the Spirit or more. Because God loves a hungry people and a hungry heart. I want to leave you with a final thought. Think on the unity of Christ and the Father and the Spirit for eternity past and eternity future. And then look at that one spot on the continuum where Jesus was completely alone, disunited with the Father and the Spirit. He was at the cross. He experienced desolation and disunity so that we can pursue unity in the church. If we start to and continue to model the unity of God within our churches, we will have exciting churches, March Madness churches. The world will know the love of the Father by the love of His people. Let's pray. Father, I thank You so much for Your sacrifice for being truly alone so that we wouldn't have to be. God, I thank you and I pray that you'd encourage us, uh, uh, embolden us to live in unity, uh, to forgive those who wrong us, to go out of our way and seek the isolated, the loner, the loser, befriend them and show them love. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.